think that all of us live our lives oftentimes in the shadow of our fears. So many times we end up not sure of ourselves because of things that have happened in the past. Now I'm not thinking about, I'm not thinking so much about the fears like um, fear of heights. I'm thinking more along the line of fear of things that we've tried and failed at. Look, let me bring this into focus for us as an ordinary human being. And yes, preachers are red-blooded, ordinary human beings, trust me on that. Long before I became almost grown up, my wife says that process is not quite yet complete. <laughs> Long before I became almost grown up, I was a tall and awkward teenager. My hair was never combed correctly, so it took three or four hours comb my hair. And there was more of it then than there is now. Our high school had a tradition of putting a musical on every year about the same time. And hey, you know what pride is? I'd been picked to sing a solo. Big man on campus, everybody is there looking up at me. I'm singing by myself, right? I did just fine at home. I did just fine when I was at play practice. I did just fine at dress rehearsal, no problem, and then came opening night. So I step up to the front and the curtains open up. And sitting out there in front of me are about six million people. <coughs> now I doubt there was more than 150 there, but to me it was a lot. And the piano was playing, and it was my turn to sing Waiting on the Robert E. Lee. Okay? So I started out just fine in my best man's voice. Way down over in Miami, in old Alabama. There's brother and sister and Pappy and Mammy. And I did just fine until I got to the end, and then my voice broke, and it ended up with waiting on the Robert E. Lee. <laughs> nice, hi. Surely all you guys have been through the same thing. <laughs> you learn to keep your mouth shut. I'm never singing in public ever again. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Those kind of fears. Those kind of fears affect us almost more than things that are born into us. A lot of, we, we had a granddaughter, Stephanie, and we took her when she was about two on a Ferris wheel at the West Side Nut Club Festival, and guess what? She's scared of heights at two years of age. She tried to climb down off of that plane. Okay? We had to physically restrain her. I'm not talking about those kinds of fears. We've all got something that, that really bugs us like that. But I'm talking about these fears that we learn to be afraid of. So what happened when my voice broke? All the people, what did they do? They laughed. You got it. Yeah, they laughed. That made it worse. Then I forgot some of the words. What did people do? They laughed again. Was that the worst part of it? No. Because the very next day when I walked into the high school, one of the big burly football players turns to me and he says, morning, squeaky. <laughs> and that ripped it for me. I was done, okay? I was ready to shrivel down into my shell because of that fear. It took me a long time to speak confidently in public. And to this day, I tell you the absolute truth here, before every sermon, my knees shake a little bit, and I break out in a little fine sweat. Okay? And I've been doing this almost 50 years. Imagine. Hey, we're all humans here. We're all humans, so we understand the situation, and I could tell you about a dozen more things that happened to me, and I'm not going to do it. They were really, really stupid. 
Okay. But I learned to fear. Honestly, it's a pure miracle I survived growing up anyway. I'm surprised I got as old as I did. Okay. That's true for you too. We've all done dumb things, haven't we? But that's the human side of life. Now, if you think understanding the human side of life is immensely difficult, then think for just a bit how difficult it is and how much harder it is to understand the godly side of life. And this morning, we're going to try to do just that. We're within a couple of weeks and a half of Easter, or so this is our human observance of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Is the calendar right? Probably not. Off anywhere from three to ten years, maybe more. But we're doing the best we can. We're humans, and that's exactly what we do. We do the best we can. Starting now, about 2,000 years ago, we need to think of Jesus in his human form. And he's standing, if you will, in the shadow of the cross for exactly the reason he came to live upon this earth. Anyway, he's supposed to die there as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Tracy, everything okay? Okay, great. Yeah. I noticed Pat and Jim had to leave, so I bring that to your attention. No. And the reason he's standing <laughs> in the shadow of the cross is because it's decision time for Jesus. You ever have to make a major decision in your life? Sure you have. You've made them, haven't you, honey? Yeah, a lot of them. Working out pretty well. Nice to be happy for a change, isn't it? Sometimes our teenage years kill us. We don't realize how much baggage we carry from them into the future. And we let it affect our religion, too. I'm guilty. And God knows it is. It's decision time for Jesus. You see, Jesus in his human form is full of doubt, just like us. He's saying... Do I have to do this? Every time up to now, he's won. He's been tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days and nights, and he survived that. He won. He made Satan turn tail and run. You don't have to live your life in evil, is what Jesus is telling us. He's been tempted by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They all, how'd they do it? Come on. Well, if you're Jesus, you're so your God, son. Surely you can do a little miracle here and, and show us, can't you? See? No, you can't. Anybody can believe a miracle. Very few people believe on faith. Let me tell you right now, it's impossible for us who are merely human to fully understand the agony that rests upon Jesus that he felt prior to the cross. Let me tell you why. I had back pain. I got about 59 stitches down that back because I was young and strong and never wrong and I was probably bench pressing about 350 when I made a big mistake and I was probably 10 pounds over what I should have had. All right? That plus a whole lot of water skiing and then I fell out of the sky. I was on this kite about 400 feet up. I think up. that's the one that You did haven't it. lived until you've fallen 400 feet off a kite into the water down below. Okay. I haven't always made the best decisions in life. I'm surprised I'm still alive, really. So while it's impossible for people just like us, maybe we can think this through in a little different way. When I had the back pain, I had the worst back pain in the world. Nobody had a back pain like mine. My mother had a bad back. She complained about it. I said, you can't hurt as bad as I'm hurting, right? That's the worst pain I ever had. Well, how many of you have had back pain? Is it yours the worst you've ever had? Right, okay. But we're going to 
going to try to understand the godly side of things. So I want you to go to your Bibles if you have them. There's Bibles on the backs of pews ahead of you. And I'm in Matthew, and I'm in chapter 26. And if that sounds familiar, it's because this is exactly the same scriptures I used last Sunday. So I want to use them to point something else out to us. I'm in chapter 26 of Matthew, and I'm in verse 36. And I'm going to read through verse 46, so 10 verses out of here. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Notice here, this is the human side of things. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. This is the death on the cross he's talking about. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. He said that, speaking of Judas, his betrayer. Jesus had no sin in him, but that night he begins to fully bear the sins of an entire world, including ours. And we need to remember that. Here's a man who's both fully human. His mother was Mary. She's human. He's birthed just like any other child is birthed. He's also fully divine. His father is God. Now think about this. Fully human, he wants to escape the cross. Fully divine, he accepts God's will. Are you and I going to be fully human? Are we too going to be fully divine? And the answer is, take your choice. Because we got some free will, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Father, take this cup from me. I don't blame him for wanting to escape the cross. And fully divine to save a sinful people, he says, Father, Thy will be done. Remember now, the divine plan of God has been made even before the existence of the world. Don't look this up, just listen. First Peter chapter 1, verse 20 in the New International Version, speaking of Jesus, says this, who was chosen before the creation of the world. The divine plan of God is implied here. The divine answer to Jesus' prayer that we just read, you know what God told him? Yeah, Jesus is going to die on the cross. There's no alternative. And I don't think we have one either. But at some point, our own crosses rest upon us. Our fears have built up inside of us. We feel sometimes excluded, rejected, kicked, and put down. On top of that, my boss fired me. Take your choice. Take your choice. There's no alternative. God had a will for Jesus, and God has a will exactly for us, too. I firmly believe that Jesus was well aware of God's plan in his life right from his birth upon this earth. Look, at the ripe old age of 12, his parents go into, into uh, Jerusalem. And all of a sudden... No, they all get up, they go home. They pay their taxes, whatever, they go home. 
they get out about two days outside of town and they look around, where's Jesus? So mom and dad, you ever had to go back to a service station to pick up your kids? You'll know what I'm talking about here. Oh, it was you I had to go back and pick up, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. We, we had a truck camper, okay? I mean, I thought it was a berries, but a lot of people laughed at it. Big old ugly brown Dodge with one of the big campers on the top. And I left her sitting in a service station somewhere, and I'm about 80 miles down the road when I realized she's not there anymore. <laughs> Turn around and go back, right? I remember that. And here I've been blaming the kids all these years. <laughs> uh, what Jesus said to his parents, they finally find him. He's in the temple. He's teaching the people who are supposed to be knowledgeable about their religion. Mom, Dad, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house doing my father's will? I knew I had a job to do in life, and I was scared of it, but I'm here doing it, and he's 12. What do you think he thought when he was 33 and faced the cross? A preacher of the past named John Wesley, this is a direct quote. Finding God's will is mankind's greatest discovery, and doing God's will is mankind's greatest achievement. I can help you find God's will. Ta da! <laughs> it's all the Bible. That's the simple part. How about these? I just pulled these out at random. I could have pulled out 500 of these. 5,000, I'm sure. What is pure religion according to God? Sitting in church? Got my tie straight? Not near as important as having my soul straight. Put a hundred bucks in the collection plate. Good grief, I haven't seen a hundred dollars since I got married. Fifty cents sound more like it. I'm teasing, don't look so upset. I'm quoting First John chapter one, verse twenty seven. Pure and lasting religion in the sight of God our Father means that we must care for orphans and widows in their troubles and refuse to let the world corrupt us. You don't have to enter into that life of sin. You don't have to fight all the time. You don't have to shout and yell at your parents every time they look at you. Can't we have a little love here? Can't we have a little bit? of understanding. I was a difficult teenager. I know, you think I'm not difficult now, but my wife claims I am, so I probably haven't learned too much over the years. Maybe I shouldn't have been. You know, maybe listening to my parents, I would have learned better how to listen to my God. I don't want that fact rubbed in my face. I don't know any teenager that does. But maybe it's time that we learn that we are families together. How do I make myself better for you, God? I know I'll pray real hard and move mountains. The Bible says I can do that. I'll pray real hard and cure everybody of cancer. Sorry. If I could have done that, my mother wouldn't have died of it. So, here's what God has to say in his Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Work hard so God can approve you. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Avoid godless, foolish discussions that lead to more and more ungodliness. This kind of talk spreads like cancer and it eats your soul 
And pretty soon you doubt God. And when you doubt God, you doubt Jesus. And if you doubt Jesus, I guarantee you the gates of heaven don't open for people who have all these doubts and fears. They don't. What do I need to do each Sunday, God? Good question. I think I'll sleep in. Then I'm going to get my golf clubs, go play around the golf. <coughs> then I'm going to take the boat out, do a little water skiing, and then we'll go out for dinner. You sounded good to me. <laughs> you got any money to eat out on, or do I have to cook my own? <laughs> Here's the answer. Hebrews 10, 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. Truth. God, what laws should I obey? Well, I think I'll just make me a copy of the Ten Commandments and hammer them in my front yard, and that'll show everybody what I believe. Whoa. Here's what the Bible says in the New Testament. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So, hey, we can find God's will. It's easy. You just go to him and read it. Basic human decency. I see a car along the road. Some people standing there with a jack going, what is this thing? <laughs> Pull over and help, right? Pull over and help. I see a problem out there. Stop and help. <laughs> I didn't mean to give away that last winter coat. <laughs> I had no, the kid didn't have one, okay? And it was freezing and sleeting, and he was so cold. Where's your human decency? A lot of this is based on human decency, but it goes beyond that. It's based upon godly decency, and what did Jesus do for us? He died. Then he came back to life. We're going to celebrate that in a couple of weeks. Praise the Lord. I say finding God's will. We know God's will. We know we ought to be helping to feed people and house people and clothe people and loving people who themselves are not very lovable because they're, what's, what's this, uh, Beavis and Butthead? Okay, this is Beavis and Butthead combined. I know about people like that. I used to be a street fighter. I know all about those things. You can live with your fist, or you can live with your heart, but you can't have both. What no one can help you with, and what I want to encourage you with this morning, is the doing of God's will that you have to do by yourself. See, a lot of people like to pervert God's will. They like to pervert God's purposes. And why not? I mean, come on, sinning is fun. If you ever drink a few beers, you got hey, a little buzz on. Ooh, I feel good. You can be your own God, you know. You don't have to listen to all this moral jazz. You can go out and do all kinds of things. On top of that, while God is sovereign, you and I have free will. The choice is not up to God. He left it up to you. There's a difference here. Why did God give us free will? Why didn't he just say, here are the rules, live by them? Hmm. Why does God give me a choice? Because you can't buy love you can't force love. You can only give love if you choose to. It happens with husbands and wives. 
happens with kids and families. It happens to fam I grew up with a huge family. There were about 13 in our house all the time. All kinds of old ladies who tried to decide that I was not properly educated, so they'd educate me. I got more education on the back side than I did on the front side, too. <coughs> Mind you, I've changed my mind. I don't believe in striking a child. I don't believe in that. I don't mind giving them a little swat and keep them out of the street better my hand on their backside than the car wheels on their head. And I've seen people who literally destroyed their children's own ego by convincing them that they didn't do it mama or daddy's way. They weren't real people. God's given us a free will. And God wants our love for him to be voluntary what good is love if you have to coerce it? What good is love if you have to beg for it? What good is love if you don't know how to really do it? Love for God, love for others has often been perverted for us. And if you think that hasn't happened, oh, trust me, it can. You ever hurt so bad all you can think about was the hurt? Yeah. Ask me what I'm thinking about now, God or my knee? <laughs> I'm up here with this leg bent, held out in the air, standing on one leg. My egret stands. If I ever find a pond to stand in, I'll probably start catching fish in my teeth. Okay? <laughs> Have you ever listened to an extremely learned scientist who was also an atheist and claimed there was no God? I was watching a program the other day. And by the way, it's on, it's on the aggregation, the clumping together of the planets early on in the solar system. Okay? That's been a mystery, a 40-year-old mystery. Nobody knew how the planets aggregated. An astronaut just recently in orbit around the Earth had a bag of several substances. He had like tea bags and coffee, and it's loose in this plastic bag, and the bag is sealed and blown up with nitrogen to preserve the freshness, and they're aboard the, the space shuttle thing, and they're going around the Earth, and they're weightless. And he reached up to move those bags, and he shook them up as he did, simply in the normal course of things. And the coffee bag was there, and he shook it up, and all these grains of coffee floated all over the bag. And he let it go in the new location. He wanted to get out of his way, and he happened to notice that they were clumping together instantly in groups. Because in the absence of gravity, the coffee gravity took over. It attracted its own grains. And he could show for the first time ever since the question was asked, how did they aggregate together? I'm happy for him. I'm sure some learned scientist is going to say that prayer is that God didn't create anything. And I tell you, if you have faith, you believe that God simply said, let it be, and it was. And you believe exactly. These, these passages in the Bible said it only took 24 hours, and God did this, and 24 hours later he did that, 24 hours later. And we have all kinds of people who want to insert their version of a scientific explanation between chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. Because they think that ought to be in the Bible. Maybe God took a thousand million years to make the earth. That's not what the Bible says. And I trust God more than I trust the scientist. You looking to have science save us? A lot of people are. You know God's will by reading the Bible. You can know God's plan by accepting Jesus as your Savior. But what can keep us close to God? I'm a firm believer in what I call practical Christianity. I think God knows our weaknesses. He never tempts us beyond what we could stand. All we have to do is draw the line in the sand and say, I'm not going in that evil place. I'm over here with God. 
try this. I am in Romans in chapter 8, starting with verse 1, going through verse 17. It'll take me a minute to read it. Don't get bored. I've been in church since my earliest memories. I started in church sitting on my grandmother's knee. Don't get bored with scriptures. Don't think, oh, I've heard this before. Apply it the way it is now. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the laws of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness, righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Draw your line in the sand. You and I are supposed to be living according to the Spirit of God and not the ways of the world. Got it? Those who live according to the flesh have their minds on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, he's talking to all of us. I hear you, God. I'm weak to you. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that amazing? For God so loved the world, you and I, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed upon him should not die, but have everlasting life. That's the promise, and that's what you need to carry out the door. How can you reach other people? Oh, good heavens. You see this outline you got there that I put it out for you? Okay? Pick up three or four of these and give them away. Go out and just show them to other people. Just say, here, my dad's a preacher. He wanted you to have this. Or you can take responsibility and say, I believe in Jesus, and here's something I think may help you. I do not have all the answers in this life. I have failed far more often than I have succeeded, and I have a tremendous number of accomplishments behind me. My resume, filled out single-spaced and small type, is nine pages long. 
and it doesn't mean a hill of beans um, without Jesus. <laughs> Is that right? Amen. 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 And God loves us so much and he gave his only begotten son. Got your books ready? Going to help you sing? Not if my voice breaks, I'm not. And the singer here with invitation. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all to.